you will have a game-changing level of bold conversation. Because you've engineered an organization and then you try to find successors who aren't going to do it exactly like you do and you find out that they don't make it after one year, which sounds very familiar because that's what the fuck happened to me in the last year. So now I realize the coaching that I needed during that period of time. But the point that I'm making for you all is your ability to engineer, your ability to engineer teamship. What happened in this situation in Russia was that the individual who was the leader found that he could free up 30% of his time and he went off to start a second business that he was incredibly excited about, a new hedge fund that he was incredibly excited about, which happened at perfect timing because when the war happened, he was able to exit to the West and his existing team continued to sustain, but he was able to have birthed an entirely new organization with a new life in the West. Um, but that's what's available to you. If you think about leading, not with authority, not with command and control, but you start thinking about leading differently, you can begin to free your time up and you can begin to have a team that steps up in ways that you would have never imagined. They step up in ways that you couldn't, you couldn't believe that they could. Now, one of the things that I want to suggest is this is equally as important in your, in your personal lives. One of the fun things that I've done over the years, I've spoken to some YPO forums and somebody came up to me afterward and said, I have a crazy idea. I've got a family office. Would you be willing to come in and do this with them? I said, well, you mean the team that invests? They said, no. My mother, my father's passed away, who, was the, who made the money and I've inherited and I've built it from there. But the, my mother, myself, and my wife are three daughters and two of their husbands and one fiance. Could we pull that team together and talk about what does it mean to be co-elevating? And it was extraordinary. We would meet once a quarter, truly understanding everybody's dreams, goals, and hopes, and engineering how that team could be fully co-elevating and supporting of each other. And of course, there was wealth uh, transfer issues that were coming to the forefront. And, and we were able to engineer, and I'll show you here in a second, we were able to engineer a, a social dynamic that is fundamentally different than exists in most companies today. I'm going to go to this one, actually. It's, it's candor. As I mentioned to you, most teams are very conflict avoidant. And if you're a leader, your team is conflict avoidant because you've engineered it to be so. I'll give you a very simple practice that's beautiful, and I could, you could use it with a family, you could use it with your team, you could use it with an ecosystem of partners. You put a critical question on the table, and instead of discussing it in a group, the, the biggest challenge that all of you have to candor is having large conversations. The average meeting of 12 people, four people think they've been heard. Now, part of that is because they're they're conflict avoidant or because they're insecure or they're introverts, but otherwise part of it might be because your reactions don't allow them to necessarily be bold or forthright. You, you put a topic on the table, you snap your fingers and you have people either turn in small groups of two or go to a breakout room of two or three. The psychological safety, psychological safety is the ability to be courageous, bold, you know, in, in, in command, psychological safety in small group conversation goes up 85%. So if you have a question for your team, you ask them, let them go into small group, open up a Google Doc and have them start answering the question in there, come back into the main room, and then have the dialogue. You will have a game-changing level of bold conversation. Candor can be orchestrated. So simply, what we've been looking at are the companies that are, I mentioned 15% of companies re-engineered the way they worked in a remote and hybrid way. And those individuals practice new practices that you don't practice. They didn't just take a boardroom conversation and move it into Zoom. They took a boardroom conversation and said, that's one way to collaborate, meetings. Screw it, we're gonna collaborate differently. Instead of showing up and having a dialogue in the room, we're going to say to the team of people, what real problem are we trying to solve here? And we're going to send a, a sheet out, 
a Google sheet, a spreadsheet, to everybody who would have come to the meeting. And the question is, what problem are we trying to solve here? And all of the people would have a week to write thoughtfully the answer. They would all thoughtfully write the answer of what's the real problem we're trying to solve and maybe what bold solution might solve that. The leader would look at that and say, holy shit, there's a whole different dialogue we should have in the meeting now based on everybody's thoughtful input. The other way, the old way of working is you showed up in the meeting, you had four people heard, probably not, probably the same four people you've always had heard, right? I call this meeting shifting. It's a simple practice, and it's called asynchronous collaboration. It's collaborating outside of meetings. Amazon and some of the boldest organizations that have re-engineered the way they work, they have created meetings as the last resort of collaboration, not the first line of defense for collaboration. Meetings should be reduced 50% in your organizations. You should be using asynchronous collaboration, and that what happens is when you do some of these things, candor significantly increases. Real collaboration radically increases. Imagine that you're announcing a new project or a new initiative, and you're trying to get buy-in. Buy-in is bullshit. Buy-in means you've created the answer and you're running around trying to sell it to people. What, what you should have been doing is using the tools available to us to have co-creation, to have a diverse audience of individuals giving you input from the very beginning. And we're not just talking about it's interesting because what we often do is we go around and we do interviews, but you're still the hub of all of that information. Then you come up with the answer and then you go back and try to bu get buy-in for it. There's no transparency. There's no sense of ownership. There's no true engagement. If you want to have an engaged employee base, engage your employee base. During the pandemic, the CIO of CVS was having meetings with a thousand of their members of the, of the IT organization asking questions like, what risks are going to bite us in the ass right now? Snap their fingers, a thousand people go to breakout rooms, people open Google Docs, they add their risks that they're seeing, they scrape that data, they end the meeting in 15 minutes, they take all that data, then they come back to the group a week later having analyzed the data and said, here's what we learned from you, now we have a different set of questions. Right? That's what's available with remote hybrid work. And again, I don't give a damn if you're five days a week in the office or two days a week. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about re-engineering collaboration to be digitally forward and to rethink what I call the collaborative stack, which is how do you start with asynchronous collaboration? How do you use remote collaboration? Remote collaboration is fantastic. You can have 30 people in a room, set up a question, send them the breakout rooms, have them engage, have them come back. It, it opens the aperture of the audience. Now, what do you do when you're personal? The worst thing that I see is when people are having their drag everybody back to the office, but you haven't changed what you've done. Or you have your leadership offsite and you're still having dinners with small talk. Your dinners when you have your leadership offsite should be rich, deep, and emotional. You should ask people what they're struggling with personally and professionally. You should have them empathize with each other by looking back and saying, you know, what experience of, of your past make you who you are today.